tuning in. Uh, we thank our sponsors, which is Epson, Pro Photo Shelter, Pro Photo, uh, Photo Shelter, Archive, and Pro Photo Daily in American Photography. Uh, tonight we have Seth Harold, who um, was scheduled earlier in the week, but got called away on other duty in uh, in Tennessee, and uh, he's back with us uh, tonight. So we'll let you share the screen, Seth, and um, off we go. Okay. Ringing is coming. From Here, these are going in the right order. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hey. Okay. So the this. Frank can just go through and explain the images. Yeah, just yeah. You, like, like how long have you been there? When's the last time you were there? When are you going back? Give us a little bit of you know your okay. journey. Um, so myself and a colleague um, we're, were in uh, Ukraine. We arrived March 9th of 2022. So in the earlier days of the Russian invasion. Um, and we spent the first kind of week and a half um, documenting Ukrainian refugees that were fleeing the war from, you know, across the country there. So um, this image um, is refugees that are making their way into other parts of Europe, Poland, Romania, um, and was taken there in Lviv at the uh, railway station, the, the central railway station there. Um, we plan to go back early May to continue coverage. Uh, we were actually supposed to be back this week, but with the mass shooting here in Nashville and everything, it's kind of in the wake of that um, that's kept me here now. Um, but yeah, um, I've been photographing for about 15 years, primarily covering social issues, conflict and, uh, politics primarily. So. And this isn't the railway station as well. Um, I believe this family was from Kharkiv area. Um, but and they were, you know, fleeing into Poland early on there in the war. Um, we had run into this group of soldiers as they were heading to the front lines um, and this was his partner and she'd followed them all the way you know till they got on the train and left um, but we spent a little bit of time with them um, they were I believe like fresh out of training and heading yeah straight to the front in the east um, and this you saw a lot of scenes like this early on with the refugees trying to leave and then you'd have the soldiers heading down the opposite end of the track, you know, getting onto the train and heading back to the front line. So there was a lot of these scenes very, very early on um, at the railway station. Um, I went back a couple of weeks later to do assignments and the railway station was just empty, like a ghost town. And it was really, really fascinating to see like there's just, you know, days on end. We were documenting millions of people coming and going and then like almost overnight just no one was there just you know it, it was really interesting to see and seth do you take a lot of notes for yourself you know do, do you do a diary do you do anything um just for sort of your own therapeutic um um mindset yes and no it depends on like you know how my mood is kind of flowing uh, there's you know sometimes um I, I have like just random kind of audio clips on my phone I, when, okay. You know, when I'm on the train or whatnot, or I just hear something like I like to kind of go back and listen and think about those moments again. Um, I do have some journals and diaries that I kind of write. They're definitely uh, I, I have not filled any of them because it's very kind of sporadic, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah. Therapeutic wise, though, it's I spend a lot of try to spend a lot of time outdoors and, um, you know, taking times with friends and family when I'm back home and whatnot. So, yeah. Let's see this, this image was made in um, Kramatorsk. This was at the train station where a few weeks prior, the Russians had, uh, had bombed the platform and killed multiple Ukrainian refugees that were uh, fleeing the area. And it's like, it's a common occurrence, unfortunately, the targeting of civilian infrastructure in, in areas. Um, I think it was maybe several weeks after this, they even, I think they bombed civilian infrastructure in Dnipro um, as well. But 
this was um very early on i mean it's still taking place but the, you would just have like kind of civilian areas around Lviv and Kiev where civilians were training in firearms training and medical training. Um, and so I spent a few days with um, this group of civilians where they're doing firearms training, being taught by instructors from Czechoslovakia and America and elsewhere in Europe as well. And uh, Seth, what, what, uh, a conscious decision to shoot black and white? Convert, you yeah, know. when I'm working for myself or with Redux um, and they give me the creative freedom to kind of just photograph how I want, like my cameras are set in camera on black and white. Um, so, yeah, it's a conscious decision to photograph. And what camera are you using? I use uh, two Fujifilm X-Pro 3s um, with prime lenses, a 24, 35 and um, a 50. So, yeah. Uh, this was on an assignment with Bloomberg, um, just kind of walking around Lviv and just getting general street scenes. Um, but these posters, I mean, you saw them everywhere. Stop Putin. And there were several other posters that they started to come out with over time. But that one at that time was very popular. And are you with a fixer now or you're doing this in, you know, on your own when you're in the so same on this assignment, I had a fixer um, just because we were going into um, like refugee centers and whatnot. And you obviously you can't I can't speak the language. I'm learning Ukrainian now. But at that time, I couldn't you know, speak any any of the uh, language at all. So, yeah, I had a speaker or a fixer here and he was helping me ask questions and do interviews and, and all of that. So. Um, and. This was in Bordyanka shortly after the Russians um, had retreated. Um, and they were, this was a, an apartment complex that they had bombed um, early on in their invasion. And um, the, those are state workers there. They were re looking for bodies and checking, you know, the various apartment buildings that were still kind of structurally sound to be able to go into and whatnot. Um, and that they were going back up to continue searching the higher parts of the apartment complex after a, a short lunch break. But um, yeah, I, we were in the car and saw this picture and I was like yelling at the driver, like, stop, stop, stop. And got out of the car and went running and, you know, made that made this image here. But um, spent a few days there as well in Bordyanka documenting the various cleanup efforts and search and rescue efforts. It's, it's sort of interesting to um, you know be in that space and then find something that sort of laid out right like the layout of that is just about perfect right? yeah you couldn't set that up but yeah no exactly it's just waiting for that moment you know or the, that thing that kind of adds because i have images of, of this same scene without the state workers being suspended you know from the crane mm -hmm. but then yeah th as i said we were driving away and i saw them suspended in the air and it was just that that was the picture you know yeah yeah, yeah. This was one of the last um, functioning hospitals in Serba Donets. Down, like we were about twelve miles from like the Russian front lines here, and this hospital was, um, yes, yeah, still functioning and operational. It was filled with some of the employees' family members, um, people who were still getting treatment, and then the elderly who just couldn't escape the conflict were also being sheltered there. Um, but and you can, and it was also being targeted by Russian artillery pretty regularly. Um, even while we were there, it, multiple shells, you know, from incoming were just you know, flying over the hospital. Um, so I, I'm pretty, I'm curious what happened. Um, cause a few weeks after uh, we were there, um, the town was occupied by Russian forces and this would have been one of the first kind of. Con point of contacts they would have had on this side of coming into that side of the town was this hospital etc right on the edge of town um but i haven't heard much about it since so so w when you go back which you said you you'd be going back at some point in may will you, does your curiosity take you to i want to go see what i had already shot and what it looks like now yeah, there's some projects I want to work on where I do want to go back to like Bordyanka um, and areas, you know, if it's still accessible to see what it does look like now um, and and kind of do, you know, juxtapose those pose pictures from, you know, then and now. I think that'd be really interesting to see. Um, 
And so, yeah, I do plan on working on some stories, that, like I said, in Bordianca, Hostimal, and the Bucha area when I go back. Um, but I don't think, I think this place is still occupied by the Russians. So, yeah, this is like an area I wouldn't even be able to access at this point, as and, far as I'm aware. And did you go to university or, or you, you, you self taught? So, um, Herb put that question in the. Um, I am completely self-taught. Yeah, I started photographing for my local paper in Ohio when I was 17. I'm going to be 32 this year. So, yeah, this is I've been doing this for what, yeah 15 years. And, yeah, self-taught. Um, and, 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 and is this the uh, closest you've been to live action? No, I, I've worked in Palestine um, and you know, lived there for a little bit and covered, you know, daily life and the ongoing conflict in that area as well. Um, in terms of photographing, I guess you could say this kind of a, a war. Yeah, it's first first time. Yeah. Um, where yeah. Uh, this was at a at like a uh, drop off point for goods like, such as food, blankets, shoes, clothing, and children's toys in Lviv. Um, and these women here were in charge of making lunch and dinner for the various refugees that were coming through and the volunteers that were there working. Um, we spent a few days even trying just to get access into this um, center um, just because early on uh, everyone was kind of worried about, you know, who was photographing what, because just so many different faces coming and going, you know, so there was um, high alert for, you know, Russian spies and all of that, even in these centers. Um, but thankfully after some convincing and talking, uh, my fixer Andre was able to get us in and we spent a few hours here documenting um, throughout the day, just the various volunteers. It was like a three story complex and each floor had something different things they were doing, you know, right. from registering refugees to food. And like I said, as you went up the flights of stairs, it was just, you know, areas with, I mean, boxes of just blankets and clothes. And it is very um, fascinating to see how all that just came together in such a short time. I mean, because this yeah. was, we hadn't been there maybe two weeks. And just all this stuff was flooding in from across Europe and Ukraine to help these, you know, help people fleeing. So, um, yeah. yeah. That's one thing we, we've seen all over the year, how well organized all of this is all yeah. these volunteers it's just amazing it, it never see, it never seems or it looks chaotic it looks all totally organized everyone's got a function and they just it just goes i mean between this and, and we, we have images of um people um you know sort of uh, assembly line molotov molotov cocktails yeah it's the same kind of thing yeah it's something very fascinating to witness when documenting there is how much unity there is between everybody despite the circumstances going on and like you just said they're they come together and they get things done it's really fascinating to see this was the retroville mall um bombing that happened in kiev early on um that was <clears throat> uh i think i believe 20 people were killed in this bombing um and that yeah that was a whole or all day that was a whole ordeal because there was they were worried about other strikes and they had to defuse some unexploded mun munitions and whatnot um but this was also around civilian i mean there's apartments all around this mall and several buildings were also damaged just from the the explosion so so, so that guy coming off the ladder there on the right side a little bit He's looking for bodies in there. What, what yeah, that's a firefight. They, there were several firefighter teams in the building putting out internal fires and searching for bodies and, uh, you know, doing search and rescue efforts and, and whatnot throughout the day. So. This was in uh, Lviv early on um, and they started going around and, you know, Protect, wrapping plastics and foam and whatnot around um, these statues and these water fountains and elsewhere around the city because these statues date back, I mean, decades, centuries, you know. So, um, yeah, you would just see 
city workers just out and about just covering up statues around churches and whatnot um, and protecting uh, their city and their their history. Yeah. Um, this is an image of a early on in Lviv. Um, you know, there's and it still is occurring, obviously, but yeah, we've documented so many funerals um, just day in and day out of multiple, um, you know, casualties to the war. Um, sometimes it'd be seven to eight, you know, funerals going on at once. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and this was that was an image from that day there. Uh, this is an image of a young man who was uh, murdered by Russian forces in Hostomol. Um, he and his friends were um, attempting to move bodies off of the streets to go and bury them of other civilians that were murdered. And they, according to his mother and the local priest, a um, Russian sniper had shot and killed him as he and his friends were trying to remove bodies. Um, but we had come across this scene um, right before the uh, war crimes investigators like, had removed his body and taken it to be buried. Um, and so they were going through Hostomol that day and exhuming various bodies. But he had been buried in his mother's front yard for several weeks. This is right after they liberated Hostomol. Um, so, yeah, early April. So how do the, the war crimes investigators, they're going virtually door to door and whatever information they could garnish from the folks that live around, they'll, they'll say, you know, we know over here something happened. I mean, is it as granular as that? Yeah, it, it's like, go, you know, so, for example, in Hostomol, um, the local priest buried a lot of, you know, civilians that were murdered. Um, so they were gathering a lot of information from him. And since he had such a tight connection within the community, community members would go to the priest and be like, you know, tell them what to happen. So he, at one point, um, you know, he had told us that he had taken the war crime investigators along and showed them things that had happened. So yeah, it, it's as basic as that. Um, and in some instances, um, yeah, and I mean, at, right after this, I mean, you, we just drove down out of this neighborhood and you got to the end of the neighborhood. There was a whole other group of war crime investigators going through people's yards, knocking on doors. So, yeah, it was, um, yeah, just as simple as that. And this was in Bordianka as well. Um, apartment buildings that had been purposely targeted and destroyed. Um, and this gentleman was just yeah riding his bike uh down his street um observing these you know what is left of his town um it, it, even this you know it's another one of those shots like how did the street get cleaned already the people are just amazing it was yeah it was i've never experienced anything like that because even when bucha was liberated early on my uh colleague was there before they had cleaned everything up and i literally got there a few days after he had photographed the scenes of the uh, Russian column that was destroyed, gone, besides like a few vehicles and the roads completely cleaned. It was really, really, uh, they wasted no time. <laughs> I, I, I guess for them, you know, it, it's those street cleaners and the, and the people that you know, can't go and fight. That's their cause for the for the war. Right. We've yeah. got to get the roads clean so our troops can get in and out and rescue missions and all of that. Right. Yeah. And, and to get back to some sense of normalcy, if that's possible, if it, you know, um, yeah. so, yeah. Uh, this was at a funeral in Lviv. Um, this, her, this wife and her family had lost, you know, their father and her husband um, to the war. Um, this was just like, again, day in and day out. These were the scenes that, you know we were seeing and are still seeing unfortunately you know, that that previous shot of the guy on the bike you know that is so reminiscent of world war ii you know other than his clothes right i mean it, it you know his man and you know just the way the people got got on bikes and found the way to get around 
it really makes me think of World War, you know, seeing old images of World War II. Yeah, there, there's, um, I mean, the war itself is very reminiscent of that because I mean, my colleague that work over here, we've, we've had this conversation multiple times where, you know, we were younger. I, I love studying World War II, but the, I've always wondered what it had been like to photograph that conflict. And it's, I, this is as close yeah. as we get, you know, and it's very sad and unfortunate that we're witnessing this again in 2023. And yeah, just a functional question. Herb, how many cameras are you traveling with? You know, I just travel with two, two cameras and three lenses, and I'm good to go. Yeah. Um, and this this was the this family. This is their um, her husband, their father that was being buried there um, at the graveyard there in Lviv. Um, and again, this is just. It was wild to just photograph these scenes day in and day out. It's just constantly, um, you know, people have lost their lives to this unnecessary conflict. It's and, really and, sad to witness. And even this, there's a formality to it within war to do it the right way. You know, you have the gentleman on the right there holding the photograph of him. You know, the, the, there's a you know there's a pageant. You know, if you if we close our eyes tight enough, it's Arlington you know, in DC, you know, doing it the right way, you, you know, it, it's not rushed. It's done with the dignity of the soldier, right? Yeah. Really dignity and respect and, and honor for sure. Yeah. Um, I believe, yeah, that that's, yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so, so we, we can open that up to any questions that people have for, um, for Seth. Um, so when you go back, Seth, what's, what's, your, what's your plan of attack? Do you go to the same areas? Do you go or, or do you find out where it's hot and you try to get closer to there? Like what, what gets, you know, what gets you first going? Um, so like when, when I go back this time, the plan is to go to, you know, out east to Bakhmut, Saladar, um, Abdika's area and document, you know, the fighting and the ongoing conflict out in the east. Um, while, you know, we have the energy to do that and then to do some of the more slower paced stories and work towards the end of, you know, the trip there, like going back to Bordeaux and Hostel and documenting what it looks like now versus what it looked like a year ago, you know. And do, do you, um, you ever think of, like in the context of a photo essay, I'm going to follow this, this soldier, I'm going to follow this group for the next two weeks or, or you come up with a story of, you know, I'm going to follow amputees, you know, do you work like that at all? Or is it more, you know, where, where the action is? Um, yeah, I do. From time to time, like I'll do a story where I'm following, you know, a person or a group, you know, um, but then other times I'm just documenting it as an, you know, as a news photographer, um, cause a lot of my background is in news working with the wires. So there's times where I'll just, you know, I'll follow wherever the news is happening or the story is taking place and and work that way as well. Okay. And, you know, what what do you do for yourself when you come back to sort of de you know, decompress? Because th this, you know, seasoned or not, it can't be easy. You know, yeah. Um, like I said earlier, I spend I try to spend a lot of time with friends and family. Um, I'm going to start being, you know, start to see a therapist as well, um, because it helps to talk about, you know, what you've witnessed and experienced in documenting. Um, cause you know, the longer I do this work, the more I've realized, like, you know, if I'm not helping myself mentally, emotionally, whatnot, I'm not going to be able to maintain doing this type of work for years to come because it's just very heavy. Um, so yeah, a lot of time with friends, family, loved ones, therapy, um, and just, Getting out outside, being outdoors even helps a lot. And is there something that's organized to um, for for uh, the photojournalist in in you know like this this is a good therapist to speak to because he or she is familiar with what you guys are going through. You know, is there something like that? Yeah. So like the Committee to Protect Journalists, um, they have um, a program where they're actually at least stateside. 
They're training um, a local therapists in various states to work with mm-hmm. conflict journalists and photographers. Um, so we have stuff, you know, programs like that. Um, other times, you know, like me and my colleagues that are good, close friends, you know, we're talking like, hey, I'm, I'm trying this or trying that you know, or keep tabs on each other. Sometimes just being able to make a phone call to a colleague and just kind of even talking about what they're going through, what I'm going through helps because they've experienced a lot of what I've also experienced. So there's different methods, you know, of, that one can kind of help themselves. Um, but yeah, there's, de- yeah, like I said, Community to Protect Journalists has a program. I think the Rory Peck um, Fund has various like programs for freelance journalists as well. So there's yeah, yeah. Different things out there. Yeah. And you have a, um, you have sort of self-awareness. I need to talk to somebody you know, or I got to get out of here. I've been here, too long. you know, do, do, you, oh, do you, yeah. Like, um, what, like what sort of, and, and if I'm going too deep, tell me I'll stop, you know, but like what, what the triggers are for you. Um, for example, like when I was there last year, I just like, when I knew it was time to go, I just had this feeling in my gut and it was with that feeling. It's like, I can't ignore this. And I just, I just knew. Right. And when I had that, you know, when I had that feeling, I bought a plane ticket and I came home. Right. Um, and, you know, I have a colleague that's worked in Iraq and worked in Syria as what. Well, so he's a bit more experienced than me working in those type of environments. And, he, and even though I had that feeling, you know, I still I try to reach out to people who are more experienced as well. So when I felt like it was time to go, I was even talking to him. I was like, hey, how did you know when it was time to go? He's like, you just know. Mm-hmm. And so and I had just knew. So, yeah, yeah um, you go. Okay. in terms of when I feel like, OK, maybe I need to talk to somebody, it's kind of the same thing or I'll notice even behavioral changes where I'm like, that's not who I am. And now it's I maybe need to get some help or talk to somebody. Right. You know? So it's just over the years, you know. You, yeah, you just become self-aware with who you right. are and how you change. It's it's weird. Like, temper or something. Yeah. 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 You know, one thing, be sure to put your, um, your contact information, your, your website, Instagram in the, uh, in the chat room. So, okay. so, so, so we have that. Um, if anyone else has any questions, um, or anything to Seth, you know, now would be the time to just jump in, um, raise your hand. Jay can unmute everybody. So, um, so, so you know, if anyone wants to ask, uh, Seth, let's see. Okay. Yeah. That's all Seth's information. Okay. Yeah. Also, Jay, put in the um, in the chat room our uh, YouTube page so people want to see this interview and subscribe. They can see that you know by the end of the week. Uh, yeah, oh, that's all in there. That's good. And yeah, Andrew, you got a question? Yeah, um, I just want to note. Um, you know, when I I was in a uh, a Polish refugee camp. Um, and there was a driver there who had worked as a photojournalist, uh, a video photographer in the Balkans for about 10 years and had to take about five years off because he he was just totally burned out, you know, Mm -hmm. so you're noting about that. But there is a group that's being run by Stanford um, medical students that is offering online medical care to patients, Ukrainian patients, both in Ukraine and who are outside of that. And a lot of what they're doing is site care, you know, psychological care. Um, so if, if there was any need to link with photographers and photojournalists and things like that, I'm sure they'd be willing to do that. Yeah, Andrew, if you have a link or uh, some information, you can put that in the chat room as well that would be um that's very yeah. helpful yeah it'll take me some time to try that down now, frank i'll send okay. it to you yeah you could do that or, or um you know uh for tomorrow or, or for friday yep how long are you um in the country on each shoot that you do and um what kind of accommodations do you have as far as being able to be you know to rest and be safe and to to eat um so typically uh you know on a reporting trip like that 
it'll be anywhere from like a minimum of two to three months, uh, maybe oh, longer, depending on the stories that I'm working on. Um, in terms of accommodations, it would be anywhere from kind individuals opening up their home to a hotel or a fixer setting up an area for us to sleep and, and whatnot. Um, and yeah, so it, it could be a, a myriad of ways to find a place to sleep and rest. Um, last time, like, you know, we just go back to Lviv if we really wanted to get away because a lot wasn't happening there. Um, and you could kind of actually just get some rest and have, you know, go out to the restaurants and whatnot because they were still open. So there's, there's ways to kind of manage. And, and yeah, that's, and a, when, that's when, a long gig. Three months is a long time I mean, to stay in a war zone um, and maintain your own security and your own sanity. That's just remarkable. Yeah. So in the evenings, when you come back, there is that camaraderie of the other journalists coming back as well, right? Yeah. That, 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 that's got to be helpful and, and um, um, therapeutic in its own way, right? Oh yeah, definitely. You know, you sit, you sit down, talk about your day or your stories you're working on, share a few laughs, maybe have a couple of drinks like that in itself. And those environments is very uh, helpful. And, and, you know, a lot of times the best part of the day. Like, yeah. So. Sure. And, and, and is there any rhythm to, you know, to covering this where it's, is there any difference between a Saturday and a Sunday and a Wednesday or is it all the same? That's interesting. Um, it's oh, sorry, our smoke alarms go off at random. <laughs> um, one second. Throw a shoe at it. This is <laughs> this is live TV, folks, and this is what happens. Uh, sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. It's live. Um, so yeah, if, if there's a difference between like, you know, say a Saturday or Sunday, like, you know, obviously if it's like a religious a holiday, yeah, there, there would be a huge difference. Um, but like when we were there last time, no, it was just kind of day in and day out. Same you thing. Know the day. Yeah. Um, and that, yeah, at that point time just starts to bleed and it's, you know, it might be Monday, but it feels like it's Saturday. I mean, it's literally right. just no idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I I didn't know if it was a dopey question, but it just it's just something that you know, do, do you feel the difference? You know. Yeah, no. I mean, I don't at least. Maybe others do, but for me, it was very much. I was just this. Honestly, it just seemed like one long constant day because it's literally just it's war. Yeah. Get up and go, get up and go, and you're photographing a lot of the same, you know, unfortunate situations. Right. Right. Um, um, yeah. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Because otherwise, we'll I, have, let... I have a question. Yeah. Uh, this is a pretty expensive endeavor to go to Ukraine. Do you have to self-finance your assignments? Do they put you on a budget? Do they give you your, your expenses after the fact? I mean, it's 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 not like the old days when there was a budget, so to speak. Yeah. Um. So. When I first go, it's all self-financed. Like that's what gets me there and, and takes care of me for the first, you know, month, two months. Um, and then usually like I've already spoken to editors before I go. So I'll have assignments lined up so I can live off whatever money I take while I wait for assignment money to come in once assignments are completed. So you, especially now, like, like what you said, there's not really budgets. So it has to be kind of done if you don't have money or come from money, like, cause I don't come from any of that. Um, it has to be done strategically or you get over there and you're screwed, you know? So, um, yeah. So yeah, it's partly self-finance and partly just waiting for assignment for the money to come in after an assignment is completed. So a like, piece of this is you really have to be a business person. Yeah, you do. And I travel, um, I was saying earlier, I travel with a colleague, we work in these environments together. So, you know, we, we split the cost of fixers, drivers, uh, food sometimes even. So yeah, it's we've been working together since 2017. So at this time we kind of have it down to a science of how we, you know, get things done. So peanut butter can go a long way, right? 
it can. And well, <laughs> in Ukraine, it was like horse meat and bread, and it can go a long way. <laughs> oh God, it's um, yeah. You can develop you can develop liking a lot of different things, right? When yeah. you have to. Yeah. When, when you absolutely have to. Um, hey, Frank, I'm sorry. I hate to interrupt. Is he serious about the horse meat? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, seriously. Yeah. That you know oh. how you can get like little salami like slices in the states. Yeah. Over there, it's little horse like slices of horse. So we just what's get it that. like? It tastes just like salami or saw. Like it, there's no real really? kind of difference to it. Yeah. It's I I honestly did not know I was eating horse until we were on a train, like one night going to Kevin. I looked down and it said you know horse on the package. I was like oh, okay. So, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so there's not really there wasn't a big taste difference. <laughs> it's um you asked, you got a good honest answer. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Start stamping out your age with your foot, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's pretty funny. That's really funny. Well, um Seth, we really, really do appreciate uh you coming in and doing this and, and uh giving us you know it's funny you, you do enough of these you think you've heard it all but you know you, you shared other things with us we haven't heard before so that's um that that's good for, for us as an audience we we learned you know we learned something else um uh so what, what i like to do is you know give you the last word on um you know what you're doing where you're going you know what you think and um we'll you know we'll let, we'll let you finish us up for the evening well, I just want to thank everyone for coming back and listening. I know Monday was a bit, uh, it was a bit hectic for me. Um, but yeah, I just appreciate everyone's time. Thank you for coming and listening to me talk. Hopefully it wasn't too quick or too short. But no, yeah, no. thank yeah, you. No, no. We appreciate that uh, very much. Um, again, you know, we're on uh, Thursday night and Friday night. Uh, so if everyone can make it, that'd be great. Seth, we only wish you to be, you know, to go, be safe, be careful, and always know when you have new work you want to present, all this is a call, you know, we, we'd love to have you back. You know? Thank you, Frank. I appreciate it. And this presentation by, I guess, Friday or Monday will be up on YouTube. Everyone will see the links. Um, and just be safe, Seth.